This is the Wealth of Wellness panel here, and we're so delighted that you're joining us this afternoon. My name is Leanne Castellino, I am your moderator, and we've got a powerhouse panel who've got some great tips, strategies for you to consider about your wellness as you uh, become new parents. Our panel today consists of a chiropractor, a chef, and a pediatric emergency physician. So we've got lots of incredible expertise to share with you. Together, we are going to talk about the wellness of mind, body, and spirit as you start your journey to become parents. What does optimal wellness look like as you move through your parenting journey? When you become a family, it's going to look a little bit different. When you become a mother, when you become a father, it's going to look a little bit different. So we hope that we leave you with some strategies and some approaches that you can use as you continue along your parenting journey. If you've ever boarded an airplane, then you're likely familiar with the image of putting the oxygen mask on yourself first before assisting anybody else. And that really is an important message because that's what we're gonna be talking about today. As a parent, you really cannot help your child or your partner or your spouse if you are not prioritizing your own self-care. Why are we calling it the Wealth of Wellness panel? Well, it's really like having savings in the bank when we talk about wellness. So when you prioritize self-care, when you prioritize your own health first, it's like you're drawing on a bank account and having savings in the bank. So on that note, let's get to introducing our phenomenal panel today. Dr. Claudia Macchiella is a chiropractor and co-founder of the Center for Health and Rehabilitation, which has locations in Woodbridge and Maple. She's also the host of The Wellness Prescription uh, on 105.9 The Region FM, which airs Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock, so be sure to listen to Dr. Macchiella. And she's also a mother of two. Dr. Macchiella, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Leanne. Let me start by asking you, how do you prioritize your wellness? Well, to me, wellness is all-encompassing. So it means that I have to maintain a healthy and balanced mind, a body, and a spirit. And becoming a parent means that you really have to focus more on that just because you need to set examples for your kids. So focusing on anything that's going to make you feel happy, your relationships, um, how you conduct yourself, the things that you get involved in, health is all of those things to me. We're going to dive deep into what Mac, Dr. Macchiella just talked about in a moment. But our second panelist today is a, a chef, a restaurateur, a food media personality, and she's also a mother of two, Corby Sue Newman. Hi, Corby Sue. Leanne, everyone, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for being here. And, you know, when we talk about food and nutrition, how, how would you say that it's important to prioritize as you become a new parent? I would say it's a journey. And the first thing I just want to say to everyone, I have two children who are now young adults, and you will get to the other side. But I would really encourage you to let go of the guilt. So number one, food is a language. Uh, what you eat and how you eat it is really important for role modeling. And the most important thing, you do not need to be a chef to be a good cook in your own home. And we'll talk about that. Absolutely. Our third panelist this afternoon is Dr. Natasha Kalia, a pediatric emergency medicine physician at SickKids. She is also a parent educator and an advocate. Welcome, Dr. Kalia. Thank you, Leanne. And thank you to everyone who's joining us today and listening to our panel. Quick question for you to start things off. Growth mindset or the mindset of a parent when they're about to become a parent, what would you suggest there? So becoming a parent, new parent, a parent for the third time, doesn't matter. I, I remind parents that it's all about what you think about yourself um, and to be very careful about some of the pitfalls of becoming a parent, again, new or old, and not to get caught up in what everyone is telling you to do and setting expectations for yourself that are unattainable. And really it's about not having parent guilt 
But I think the biggest thing I want to say is that you're going to make mistakes. And it's okay to make mistakes. It, we're humans and that happens. And if you get caught up in that cycle of, I can't make mistakes, I need to meet certain standards of being a parent, this is what I see, this is what I should be, the wellness part goes out the door, both for yourself and for your family. So those are the common things I see and deal with with families when they come to the emergency room or when I see them outside of the emergency room. Lots of important advice there already. My name is Leanne Castellino, and I am the host of Where Parents Talk, which is a podcast. And we also have a parenting community called whereparentstalk.com. Uh, I have two children, or three children as well, who are a little older, uh, but certainly my own wellness journey is something that continues. I've learned a lot, and I continue to learn a lot about my own wellness as my kids get older. And the, what I would add to what you ladies have said is it's really, for me, being proactive and prepared and prioritizing. So three Ps, uh, your own wellness in order to make sure that it's there when you need it and when you know a crisis or something challenging happens in your life. So we have information about all of us up on the screen. So if you ever want to learn more about us, there we are. If you have questions today, we are so uh, looking forward to answering them for you. We're going to take the questions at the end of the panel. So hang on to your questions if you can. And we are going to be using the hashtag wealth of wellness. So if you have, if you'd like to share that, by all means. And we're also going to have a video cast and a podcast of this panel uh, that you can watch if you miss anything today. So be sure to take down our information and you can watch it or listen to it there. So let's start with our discussion. Now, there are all, there's all kinds of scientific research on the link between the mind and the body. The idea that our thoughts and feelings are really closely tied to how our body functions. If we're feeling overwhelmed, that will likely translate into our behaviors and the decisions that we make. This is a really important point. Dr. Macchiella, there's so much for a new parent to know. What would you say that, you know, kind of rises to the top for you when you talk about wellness with a new parent? Well, it's, it's no different when you're a new parent or an expectant parent than when you're no, neither of those. It's about being aware of what your body is telling you. Our bodies are so intuitive and so intelligent that it will give us signs and clues and tips when something doesn't feel right. And the reality is we sometimes ignore those signs and symptoms. Taking care of your body should be the first thing we do regardless of our, you know, of our state. When you're pregnant, you need to understand, or if you're an expectant parent, expectant couple, you need to understand that you need different things for your body. Maybe more rest, maybe better nourishment, maybe much less stress. And those are the top three things that you must prioritize. The rest, decreased stress, and really good nourishment. Because what you're doing is you're storing it's like an oven without a window. We don't really know what's happening in there, but we know we're making something magnificent. So being focused on that is so important. You said nutrition. Very, very important <laughs> all the time, but yeah. especially for new mothers. Corby Sue, this is what you do all day, every day. What, what's your top line that you think parents should know about nutrition, meal planning, and meal prep? All right, <clears throat> so as a, a mom and a cook, I'm going to speak straight to you. The first six weeks of the arrival of your newborn, you are going to be the talk of the town. Your community is going to embrace you. They are going to take care of you. And then all of a sudden, they fall away. So I want you, if you're able to, if there's a, a dish that your favorite aunt makes, ask her to make that for you, put it in your freezer. If you have never had a shopping list in your life, friends, now is the time. Have a shopping list. Have it on an app. Have it with online grocers. Set it and forget it type deal, okay? I'm talking very practical. And third is really don't be shy to ask for help. I'm happy to dive into more um, ideas about how you feed yourself during this journey because it is a journey. But just, I would say, pre prepare for the first year, which is almost like entering a twilight zone. 
That is an excellent analogy. And for those of us who have kids, yes, yes, yes to what you just said. Uh, Dr. Kalia, it's impossible to know how a new parent, mom or dad or partner, is going to feel once that baby arrives. Can you take us through, because you see this at a very different intense level in what you do every day. What are the, some of the common pitfalls that parents fall into, new parents in particular? I love this question um, because usually when this question comes up, I actually sit with parents and I have them self-reflect. So I ask them, what are some of the challenges that you have been meeting or some of the challenges you feel are being imposed on you? And so we're not obviously here polling the audience quite yet, but when we get into more questions. So pitfalls, number one, setting expectations of the way being a parent is right from the beginning. So either from the way you had your first child or this is your brand new child and everyone's trying to give you information, everyone's trying to tell you how to be a parent, that's number one. That expectation only leads to frustrations and failures. And then we see there's clinical data that shows the more expectations you put on yourself, the more your chances of not meeting those expectations and then your mental health wellness goes down because your happiness goes down. It's number one. Number two is trusting every source that you see out there. So you're out there researching everything about being a parent, being a new parent, being a parent for the third time. But the question is, are you looking at trusted resources? So when you're scared and you have questions, what happens is you start asking other people who are parents, which is okay, but everything's anecdotal because what's gonna work for one parent is not gonna work for potentially another parent, one in the way of raising your child to your child's wellness. Um, and that starts to also start to cycle. And so question is what resources are you using? And the last is the guilt. And I'm gonna push that one out there because I cannot tell you how many times I have parents coming in and they're coming in due to something in the emergency department for their child and you start talking to the parent and the parent starts having these feelings of, I feel bad for this. And an example of that is their baby rolled off the table. That happens. It happens to parents everywhere. It's a common thing. But for some reason, we've developed guilt. And it's not the guilt of, oh, I'm a mom or a dad, and it hurts that I watch my child go through it. It's what are people going to think of me when they know I came to the emergency department because my child rolled off the table? And it's an interesting battle to have to talk to families about it. But a lot of, them, a lot of that is self-reflection. Why? How do we work through that? How do we make that better? And how do we get you to a point where you make decisions for you and for your family and for your child? So many incredible golden nuggets in what everyone has said so far. So I hope everybody out there is, is taking notes because I wish I had this the first time around. And certainly it's information that never gets old. Now, Dr. Macchiala, you are a chiropractor. As a healthcare practitioner, what do uh, new moms or even expectant moms come to see you for? Before I answer that question, I just want to let you all know that both of my kids fell off the bed and they're in the front row and they seem perfectly fine, so <laughs> you're okay. <laughs> um, but in my own practice, I see lots of pregnant women. I see lots of women uh, who are planning a pregnancy you know, within a certain number of months or they're thinking about it. So I treat them from like beginning through the pregnancy and then especially after the pregnancy. So a lot of the things we see is as your belly and your bump is, is starting to grow, you, people, women tend to get sciatic pain or they tend to get what we call broad ligament pain. It's extremely painful when you're going through it, but it is manageable. Um, and it does go away the moment you give birth. So there is hope. Uh, but there are a lot of things that I can do, and I treat so many women with it. And while you're in it, you think your body is never going to recover, but I'm here to tell you that it does. Um, so broad ligament pain, sciatic pain. Sometimes there are women who come in because their baby is not going head down when it should. So there's a few maneuvers that I can do to kind of encourage that little bundle of joy to do his job, his or her job, uh, and get in the right position. Uh, but, you know, we're all here to tell you that these months of pregnancy, post-pregnancy, they're, you know, they're new, they're scary, but we've, we've all survived, so we're good. <laughs> now, survival has a lot to do with what you are eating and what you are feeding, not just yourself, but ultimately your family. Corby Sue, 
you know, meal preparation is a huge challenge for even couples or single people. Can you take us through some easy ways to address that when you go from a, from a couple to now a family? So I, I touched on before that first year is like a twilight zone. Uh, I spoke about the shopping list. The other thing I want to encourage you is to drop the guilt. If there is a ready-to-eat option out there that delivers a meal kit service, something that's going to support you in eating well at home, do it, sign up. Don't feel guilty. But I just want to quickly break down that first year. So the first four months, I literally call it survivor mode. You and your baby, and it could be your second child also, and you've got another little one to, to worry about. Um, it's eat, sleep, fill in the blank, repeat. Yeah, that's pretty much your first four months. So the foods that I want to encourage you to think about is what are your six ingredient recipes? So that could be a protein, two veg, a starch, Moms, please do not drop the carbs. You and Bubby need the carbs, okay? I just want to say that. Um, a flavor maker, and maybe there's a dairy. And I'm just going to give you an example. So it could be a Greek-style yogurt with a protein powder, some berries, some seeds, right? Or, and I talk about them later, I had a lot of one-hand wonders. So... There's a lot of different quick cook grains that you can cook ahead, get friends, family to cook them for you, whether it's quinoa, rice, barley, portion it, put it in your freezer, pull it out when you need it. And again, I mean, I'll, I'll share what my personal first four month dish was, because it was a one hand wonder. I could hold my son in one hand, I could nurse him, and I could eat a fork with a, a, a spork, actually. The spork was my utensil of choice. It was didolini pasta, it was pesto, tuna, grape tomatoes, um, a little bit of feta, and some arugula tossed through. Boom. Okay? Just be kind to yourself, but don't forget to feed yourself. So six ingredient wonders, one hen wonder, and whoever else can help you. You really make it sound so simple, Corby Sue. Anyway. Honestly, it's, it, that's amazing. Uh, Dr. Tash, when we talk about... Um, and you alluded to it earlier, external noise. It's such a big factor today with social media, the internet. I mean, there's lots of good with it and there's lots of noise that comes with it. Right. Any tips on how to filter that out for a new or expectant parent? I love this question and I'm gonna look at the audience for a second and I'm gonna put a question out there for those expected parents or the ones that are becoming parents again. Show of hands, who is having an issue with that? Where to get the good resources, who to trust when you're talking or asking questions about, anyone having struggles with that? I got hit. Be proud of that hand up there. Why? Because if we don't know that it's a struggle, then we don't know how to address the struggle. And in a world where right now we are moving towards social media as a primary source of information, it is very hard when information is being thrown at you all the time. The next part I'm gonna say has a caveat to it. I'm gonna say anyone who has a license to practice, anyone who is a true medical professional should be someone that you trust and should be someone that provides you good medical information for your children or your future baby. That is no longer always the case and we don't see that as often anymore. So what I would say is encourage you to do a few things. One, when you're looking at your source of information, if they have a license, see if their license is still in function because you can actually search and make sure that they're still practicing. Number two, if their page is full of buy this, buy that because I'm gonna scare you into believing you need all these things, it's a red flag. It, we know this, this is very, there's lots of statistics around it, there's a lot of data on it. Number three, look at what they're actually putting in their content. So if their content is repeated, recycled content versus fresh content that's addressing issues that are known to you as a expected parent or a family, that will also help you de decide if that is good content for you. The biggest pitfall to this is that Many people don't still know the difference, and then you're going to start taking 
you know, people's opinions, follow this person, follow that person, follow this person, but you don't have the guide on how to determine, well, is my friend or my family member following that person because of something else? So really, it's a scary world, we get it. Uh, your primary care practitioner should really be someone that you trust and build a really good relationship with. If you don't, I encourage you to find someone you have that relationship with. It is super important as a parent that that relationship is built so that you feel that trust and that you're guided in the right way. Wow, so many, so many incredible golden nuggets once again. Um, when we talk about spiritual wellness, Dr. Macchiella, it's not something that many of us really think about, I don't know, on the day to day, but when you're talking about this particular demographic of, of new and expectant parents, what would you say that there are that they should look at or consider to preserve their spiritual wellness? It's always such a, a, a tricky topic. You know, being pregnant sounds amazing and sounds wonderful, and it in fact is, but it's not always easy. So I always recommend parents to never lose sight of the miracle of life that is actually happening within you. You know, our bodies are incredible, and the fact that a woman's body can grow and nurture this beautiful being is, 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 is amazing, but it requires a lot of energy. So focusing every day on just the gratitude of what you are capable of and the gratitude of what your responsibility will be later on. I mean, you are bringing the next generation into this world. And when you take that seriously and you can appreciate it, you will really enjoy the wonder of what's really happening in your life and in your body and the little aches and pains and the sleepless nights and the worry and the rushing to the ER in the middle of the night to see Dr. Tash um, isn't going to seem so hard and difficult. You know, if you're not making the perfect 12-course meal, it's okay. Be grateful that you provided some healthy options. Don't forget to take care of your mental health, your spiritual health, and being a parent is going to be so much easier if you do that. Without question. When it comes to nutrition, um, there's a lot to know. And you've alluded to some of the key pieces already, Corby Sue. So if people are going to give you food in the first few days after you've had that baby, take it. Don't ask questions. Just take it. Take it with a smile. But yeah. could you give us some idea of how to come up with a strategy on how to manage all things around meal planning mm -hmm. and preparation? Yeah, it's hard. I'm not going to lie to you. Of course it's hard. Um, that first year, so I spoke about the first four months. You know, you'll probably get to that last bit of frozen lasagna that auntie brought you and you're like, what do I do now? So guess what? You now are about to go on a new food journey with your little one. So anywhere between four to six months, depends on, depends on the medical advice. I'm from a generation where literally four months in one day, my son, he was eating, <laughs> right? Okay. okay. Um, so you're gonna start with purees. And I just I really wanna call this out. Babies actually develop taste buds in the womb at nine weeks. So we are born with more taste buds than we leave the planet. And that's something I think all parents, you actually don't underestimate your role in sharing a food language. So that first four months, purees, uh, once you've introduced about six different um, ingredients to your little one, and by the way, their preference will always be for something sweet. And that's just basic biology, right? Because, yeah, because we have more sweet receptors and, and the bitter... Um, basically spoke to, it was dangerous, it could kill you. So that's why your little ones love sweet. I would say after you've introduced those first six ingredients, start to introduce some herbs and spices. Yes, friends, you heard me say herbs and spices for little ones. And cinnamon and cumin are brilliant. Blended into a sweet potato, um, roasted, uh, anyway, all that to say, don't underestimate the value of flavor because that's actually how you deliver nutrition. You're making me hungry, Corby Sue. <laughs> me too. I want food now. <laughs> um, Dr. Kalia, pivoting a little bit, you see parents, families, babies at a very intense time as a pediatric emergency physician. 
Can you take us through how to simplify navigating the healthcare system if and when an emergency or something takes place that you need to take your baby to the doctor or the hospital? You're giving me a mountain here because uh, you, uh, you said simplified and then you said healthcare system. <laughs> And I think we all know that there's nothing simple about our current healthcare system. And I say that with all the love in the world because I work in it. But I also wear the advocacy hat as a parent advocate and educator. And it's not simple at all. It's absolutely frustrating. It's aggravating. It's scary. It's a big unknown at times. And so I will start with saying establish good primary care at a very, very early age. We are all about preventative medicine, proactive. If you do not have an established primary care, which again, I'm saying this knowing full well, we are at a shortage of primary care. But if you are lucky and fortunate enough to get one, that person is the central being to your child's wellness. They make sure that they have their wellness checks. They pick up on things quicker than anyone else does. They're supposed to be your biggest advocate. So that's number one. Walk-in clinics and urgent cares are not primary care physicians. They are intermittent physicians. Those are meant to be when you can't see your primary care and you have something that's not emergent, then go into those. But again, they are not established ongoing care and that care can be lost in the system. So when your primary care sees you, they may miss some of these visits and that is about comprehensive care. And the last is the emergency room where I am. There's lots of things that parents, and we understand parents think are emergencies. As a parent, everything freaks you out. We get it. We get it. We know it's emotional. We know it's scary. We know that you don't have, you don't have answers. And sometimes you have too many questions because too many people are giving you different answers. We get that. But what I can say is that if you do come to the emergency room because you think something's happening that's emergent, we need to be cognizant of the fact that the emergency room really is that, and it's life-threatening, limb-threatening, emergent things that need surgery, emergent things that need trauma management, emergent sick, unwell children. And so one of the things I ask parents is to be very understanding that if you choose to come to the emergency room, we are very well-versed in triaging. We have a triage system. You're, you're triage in a way based on multiple different things at triage, and you are in a good place in case something changes. So even if we don't think it's an emergency, we're open. We are there, we're there for you. But when you're waiting a long time, it's not a lack of people working, it's because that's the triage system. And there are people who need our care within seconds, within minutes, and take a lot of our time. And that is, the way the emergency room is built. I just don't think everyone is familiar and understands that. And I think we need to do a better job of educating on that. Along those lines, I think one of the things that I would add, if you do have, or if you notice something with your baby that's health related, you know, don't wait, right? Try to figure out, you know, do whatever you have to do, the first steps, whatever they are, be in tune with your baby so that it doesn't become a crisis. Babies have an amazing way of communicating with us 100%. if we want to hear them. So that's what I would add just as a non-physician. And I'm going to add one more thing. I know how easy it is to pick up the phone and call your parent or call a friend. I can tell you I have seen delayed presentations because people have chosen to listen to advice that is non-medical. And I want to rem remind everyone that your child's life and your child's wellness is not linear. Just because these ladies' children did something doesn't mean that if they, you do the same thing for, their, for your child, it's going to be the same result. That is not, children are humans. We are all different. We all react differently to things. So if you're worried about your child's health, don't pick up the phone and call someone else and delay. If you're concerned, come in, be seen. That is the most important thing I can say. I just want to add something. It's interesting because you made a good point. Your baby will tell you. But remember that babies are so resilient. Their bodies are rubbery. They, they're not like, yeah, they bounce, they bend. They're not stiff like we are, or I am anyway. So being aware that sometimes you can act as your own triage nurse and say, okay, 
my baby fell off the couch, but he, she or he is still giggling, still moving, still wiggling everything. Maybe it's not an emergency room scenario. So just keeping that in mind, the babies will tell you and you as a parent should really just stay in your lane and go with your instincts. Speaking of being bendable, yeah. <laughs> bend. yep. let's talk about fitness yes. as it relates to both the expectant mother and how to continue to adopt, sustain fitness beyond after the baby's born. Well, yeah, exactly. Loaded, loaded. But fitness has always been a huge and very important part of my life. So if, whether I was active prior to getting pregnant, having kids, after having kids, I made them part of my fitness routine when they were really young, right? So taking them for long walks or doing mommy and baby classes. I felt that that was a great way for me to keep myself healthy mentally, physically. Um, but making sure, and as Leanne alluded to, you have to put the mask on yourself first before you can help anybody else. So maintaining your level of activity so that your body is functioning optimally is the best thing you could do for yourself and for your family and of course for your baby. So being as active as you can, and even if that just means going for a 45, a half an hour walk every day on your own with or without baby because you need it for yourself, maybe finding some online uh, um, YouTube videos of yoga or Pilates, um, just to do something for you because your physical fitness is going to set an example for your child. If you're feeling tight and sore and achy, you're not going to be wanting to lift the baby out of a crib at three in the morning. You won't have the capacity. So focus on your mobility because that will help to determine your longevity. And doesn't it make everything easier if your spouse or partner can participate with you? Absolutely. To us, in my family, fitness is like a family affair, whether they like it or not. <laughs> they come on our Sunday walks. Uh, you know, they, we, we have a gym membership. So we do things to encourage our own health and wellness. And we've been doing that since they were very young. So it's just kind of part of what we do. As they get older, and I'm going to share a quick uh, personal story. I have three kids and they all played hockey. And we quickly realized that instead of sitting there and watching that hockey game or that practice, start walking around that arena. Just do laps. You're still watching what's going on. It's viewable from everywhere. But instead of being, you know, stationary or sedentary, just move. And it took me a few years to figure this out, but we did. <laughs> but we did. There's always, there's always a, a solution to be had. Uh, advice that I got uh, when I was a very new mother, which has carried through to this day has to do with meal preparation and planning and we still do it and that is to prep meals on a weekend in our case it's a Sunday afternoon for the week what other meal prep tips can you share Corby Sue I will share some but can I just touch on the fitness this might be a surprise to everyone I am not uh, a sporty person but I want to talk about mental fitness, actually. Um, so my family, we've always had um, memberships to the art gallery. Believe it or not, despite the accent, I'm originally from Australia. So being outdoors um, was very simple, going to the beach, uh, going to markets. I just want to say that that's really important also, if that's something that brings you joy. Um, when it comes to meal planning, you know, I, I think the minute I say the word, I almost see people's eyes glaze over. But the truth is, I'm just going to say it again, the reality is it does require some effort. I've noticed uh, eating patterns change over the last couple of decades. And I think we've really become a bit of a mix and match kind of people. We tend to snack. We tend to like those quick grabs. So again, I would just encourage, like, what are proteins that you like having in your fridge? My kids have grown up with hard-boiled eggs always being available. That's such an easy task to get someone to do. There's always lots of um, chicken. You can buy roast chicken in the grocery store now. Anything that's going to make it easy for you. I spoke about those quick-cooked grains. A lot of people don't realize you can actually freeze rice. I know that's almost sacrilege that I'm saying that, but you can 
have a lot of things in your freezer. Um, even just having cut vegetables. You know, you could ask your partner, okay, your job today, please, can you just cut me a jar of carrots, a jar of celery, radishes, put it in water, put it in your fridge the minute you open it up, there it is. Have some store-bought hummus that you like, add in a little bit of chili flakes if you like that. That's okay for the baby, it's not terrible, okay? Um, anyway, so I, I really just would encourage whatever, especially in that first year, because to your point before, uh, you're not doing the 12-course dinner. So don't beat yourself up about that. And the other thing I want to say, this twilight zone that is that first year, you're going to be having breakfast for dinner. You're going to be having dinner for lunch. You know, the whole, oh, we have to do this this way. Mm -mm, that's not how it works anymore. And you know what? Surrender to it. That's excellent advice. Because once you let go of that, everything just is so much more free, right? For sure. Dr. Kalia, can I ask you about your own self-care practices, right? You've got an intense job, shift work, on call. You go into work, you're seeing babies, you know, struggling, life and death situations. When did you adopt self-care practices in your own life and what was the impact of them? I'm gonna be very honest. I'm still trying to adopt a really good pattern um, it's a, it's a constant changing pattern. I try, but I'm going to be like, if I'm going to be here and I'm going to try to tell everyone to do it for themselves, I'm going to say that it's a struggle. It's not easy. Other things take priority. I'm too tired from work. I've had a really rough situation at work, bad case, and nothing in that moment is going to change how I feel and get me up on my Peloton or at the gym. I've always been very active. I was a competitive swimmer, competitive volleyball player at a really young age. And I think personally coming from that, I'm, I'm still internally struggling with the fact that I can't get myself up at a certain time to do these things. But I think that's where it comes down to. It's being realistic with what goal you're setting for yourself from a fitness and wellness standpoint and defining fitness and wellness for yourself. Because if fitness and wellness is making it to the gym four times a week, that was never gonna be realistic in my job with the hours and so on and so forth. So I have learned to divide fitness into two things. One, can I at least do something physical that is not walking around or running around an ER or doing chest compressions? I mean, that's all physical, but if I'm not doing that, can I incorporate maybe 20 minute leisure bike ride? Can I walk around the block with my two puppies? Uh, you know, go out and walk around the ROM at night with my best friend last night. Walked around, that was a lot of stairs, right? So I look at that as fitness. But the other part, especially with the job that I do, and I think I relate, I can relate to the, a lot of the parents that I talk to is the mental health, mental, you know, strength. And there is a wellness component to that. And so what do I do for that is I sit down and watch garbage TV. I watch... I'm telling you, Survivor, Amazing Race, I don't watch Housewives, but I will watch anything that disconnects me from the real world for 30 minutes to an hour, and my mental health is improved, and that is fitness. Because if I can't get up each day and have a strong mind, it doesn't matter how physically strong I'm gonna be, I can't be good enough for parents that are in this room right now, and I can't be good enough for any child that comes in my way in terms of comes through the ER and I won't be good enough for myself. So you got to find the balance of both, but it's about defining what that means to you so that you don't get upset at yourself for not meeting an expectation that's very unreasonable. It's such an important point because there's so much every single day, more and more science coming out about that mind-body connection, Absolutely. right? And you can't overstate it because the fact is, is ladies, you're the ones that everybody in the household is counting on, you mums out there. So if you're not functioning at all or a as well as you could be, everybody else seems to kind of, you know, fall apart a little bit. And that's going to happen at different points in your life. Sometimes we also need help, supplements, 
what would you like to say about that in terms of we talked about the fitness, but sometimes, you know, you need to, you need more help. Yeah, you, we, yeah, Dr. Tash and I talk about this often. Um, we, we do need help. So we need help with a lot of things, but yeah, your body also needs some assistance. And my favorite supplements, the ones that I recommend to probably 99% of our clients are magnesium, because it's a mineral that we don't store, we need it every day, and it is responsible for so many interactions in our bodies, your you know, carbohydrate metabolism, the soreness in your muscles, anything you can think of, magnesium is your best friend. So I take it every night, my kids take it, hopefully they take it every night. Um, we are huge advocates for magnesium. I would say stay on your fish oils. Um, because you need that for, you know, anti-inflammation. I need it for my joints now at my age and mom's too. And the other important one is vitamin D. So I keep it very simple. You know, you don't want to be eating your vitamins, uh, swallowing pills for your vitamins. You want to be nourishing yourself properly. But those are the three big ticket ones, magnesium, vitamin D, and of course, fish oils. At what point should they start being taken? So uh, that's our. That was our conversation. Go we back to our. We just had a podcast yeah, about this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a. That's also a loaded question. Yeah. So, I don't recommend it for babies. I recommend it for teens, preteens who are. Think about how active our kids are today. You will see all of you new parents out there. Your kids are going to start being active, intense by probably age five, six. They're going to need a little bit of help sometimes. But I would say teens are going to need a little extra just because our nutrients in our food are not as rich as they once were. So we need to have a little bit of a push, but nothing crazy. Just stick to the basics and make sure that you're eating those nutrient-dense foods. Speaking of food, Corby Sue, trick question for you. Not every new mom or new dad is going to want to have anything to do with the kitchen. Maybe they've avoided it actively their entire lives. What would be some tips for you to help those new parents cope? The reality is food is a language. Your children are really going to learn by what you role model. So I'm not saying that to, to pressure or guilt anyone, but you just need to make that decision that the way you've eaten up until that point, if you, if you believe that's good enough, let me tell you something. The minute I became a mother, it was all about them. And in many ways, it still is. Okay, I am a chef. My dad was a chef. I'm really fortunate. I grew up great role modeling. But today, again, there are lots of options out there where you can... You can really get food that's already made or you've just got to do a couple of things to it and cook it. Go find out what they are. But here's my one tip. If you're still someone who really doesn't want to have to do the cooking, there are ways you can add whole foods into the prepared stuff. So it's, it's like a methodology I'm asking you to think about. So if you're going to eat a packaged lasagna and a packaged garlic bread, could you just get some leafy greens from the vegetable section? As long as at least one of those elements is a whole food, you're on the right track. And once you start eating those kind of foods, I promise you, you are going to start to recognize, wow, I feel really great. I just want to share a very quick story. So in, in my past life, I have literally taught thousands of preschoolers. Um, and one of the favorite recipes is making pizza from scratch. It's actually really simple. I'm sure you've all seen it a million times on YouTube. So about 15 years ago, I'm running these classes. And a mom came up to me the following week, and she said, I just want to thank you. She said, I had a really rough day, came home, said to my little one, let's have pizza for dinner. She gets on the phone to make the call, because that's how long ago it was. She could hear her little one in the kitchen clanging away. Her daughter was four, and she was grabbing flour and a bowl. Because what her daughter had learned in a cooking class at preschool with me was that you could make pizza, that a kid could make it. And she said, what you did was my daughter taught me a lesson. So maybe also use this as an opportunity for you to learn from your child, not just you teach them. Huge point, and there's so much to unpack in that because... Let's say you're a parent who takes the role modeling that you talked about 
seriously, which you should, because they're watching everything we do from an early age, definitely. And you want to improve your culinary skills. What kind of tips can you offer on how to overcome? Because oftentimes it's that fear. And once you get over the fear, you know what? It could be smooth sailing after that. There's a lot of resources, whether it's in your own community, whether there's someone that you love the way they cook something, go make the effort. You know, I always say to people, treat your kitchen as you would your wallet, right? You all know where your wallet is. You know what's in it. You know what's going out of it. Am I right? Okay, mainly it's a phone nowadays. <laughs> I, I say do the same thing with your kitchen. Whether you go online for resources, heck, you can follow me. I'll teach you how to do it. But start simple. Now is not the time to do a 180. Start simple. Drop the guilt. It is hard. It requires some effort. But my gosh, the benefits are I've got an 18-year-old daughter who now cooks half the weekly meals. That's awesome. I did well. <laughs> yeah, you did. Congratulations. Where do I sign up? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Well, and you know, the other piece, and you alluded to it, is that you're really building healthy uh, food habits and nutrition habits for life. It starts the second that they start eating, you know, solid foods, even before that, you could argue, for sure. Dr. Kalia, switching gears a little bit here, you are a big proponent of mindfulness. Why is that? And what can you tell us in terms of strategies that we should look at? Are we asking about me as a physician? Or are we asking about new expectant parents? Both. I think there's a common ground with mindfulness, and I think it also depends on the way you view mindfulness, because I think there's different variations, right? If you're talking about mindfulness in the spiritual way, that's one thing. If you're talking about mindfulness as in just common love, respect for one another, and love and respect for new parents, and that communication piece, that's a whole other one. When I talk about mindfulness, uh, I talk about it in a way of parents being able to advocate for themselves in the sense that being a new parent is difficult, being a new parent is chaotic, being a new parent is scary, even not just a new parent. I think even if you've had a second and a third, if you've been fortunate enough, it is all of those things. But mindfulness means the ability for you as new parents, as old parents, to also draw the line of where you protect that piece that's internal. And we're at a stage now where we are seeing a lot of struggle, a lot of lack of boundaries. I'm gonna say that word out loud, I'm gonna put it out there. And when parents, new parents specifically, don't set boundaries, and that means boundaries with family, boundaries with friends, boundaries that protect you, then things start to get a little bit more chaotic and that mindfulness goes out the window. Remember that boundaries are not meant to be negative. Boundaries are meant to protect you as new parents, as old parents, to set goals for yourself and it's healthy. It is extremely healthy and when you don't set those boundaries from the beginning with a first child, and I'm gonna use the example of I don't want my friends coming around and my family coming around in the first month of life. Why? Because that's a high risk time for babies and everyone likes to be all up in your baby's face, kissing and hugging your baby. And babies that get sick in that age are scary. And there's a lot that comes to one, even, one fever at that age where you're gonna end up coming to the emergency room. That, that has to happen. But if you don't set that boundary, that can happen and then for life, people are going to assume that it's okay for them to step over, you know, your, your requests. And that gets chaotic as a new parent, because once it starts then, then it continues like that until you are firm in your beliefs. And then all of a sudden, when you start getting those boundaries in place and people start recognizing that you're going to hold them, you protect yourself, you protect your family, you protect your child, but it is healthy and you are healthier for it in terms of what is it that I want as a parent? How do I want parenting to look for me? And what do I want to do with that as a whole? So I think people need to realize mindfulness is not just a spiritual thing. Mindfulness is about what do you put in place to be the most successful parent you can at a time knowing that you're going to make mistakes. You know, it's interesting when you talk about boundaries. I know a boundary for, for my husband and I when we became new parents was anything to do with sleep as well. 
So nap time was like the golden time and we would not let anybody interfere with baby's nap time. And I have to say, it was something we never regretted because they were all great sleepers. So let's say you're ready to go grocery shopping, but it's the baby's nap time. The baby doesn't know that. And you're probably going to throw that, talking about chaos, you know, uh, throw some chaos at that little one uh, when maybe you don't need to. So planning around sleep schedules is, is also really important. Dr. Claudia, when we talk about, um, you know, you've got two kids, they're late teens, early 20s now. What are some of the strategies that have worked for you uh, in terms of just preserving your own self-care, but sort of shortcuts that you use with your family? And you gave me one the other day, which I thought was so brilliant, order of operations. Yep. <laughs> so it sounds crazy, but I actually try to run my household like my business. So we have a schedule and I'm getting better. Okay. My son is 17, almost 18. My daughter's 15. I'm getting better at understanding that every day is going to shift and change a little bit, but we do have a very strict schedule of who's doing what, when, where. And every week we kind of have a recap of what's coming up in that week because I'm very busy myself. And one of the things that I chose not to do was compromise my career. I, I wanted to have something to do that was mine, aside from the most important job of my life, which was being a parent. So we do have a system. I call it order of operations. Okay, what has to happen today? What's gonna happen tomorrow? Do not forget this. Um, and I find that it works for all of us. My husband, who goes with the flow, is uh, also very organized. And I feel like it helps because now we have two teens that are getting organized and understanding how important it is to be organized. They're not quite there yet, but neither am I. But what I've learned from them, and this is what you're going to learn from your own children, is that they are much more resilient than we are. So they accept change. They don't mind the changes that happen to schedule because they're like, well, what's the big deal? We'll just do that later. And I've learned that and I'm slowly learning that. Um, and back to the whole mindfulness, meditation. I take 10 to 20 minutes every day to meditate before I go to bed because that's my time. Um, so that helps too. But yeah, order of operations. I've tried to run my house like an ER. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let me tell you, it, doesn't, it does not work. <laughs> That's funny. Is there such a thing as order of operations in the kitchen? Absolutely. <laughs> there is, but not in my home. No. <laughs> you know what? Um, I, I love what you've shared, and I was very much that person. And then what my, did, what my children did for me as a busy working chef was make me stop. They soften my edges. So your approach works, and I think there's also an improvisational approach. It's really understood in my family that my daughter and I are very much back of house, which means we're the kitchen, and my son is very much front of house. He sets the table, he takes out the rubbish, and we didn't need to be explicit about that. It was implicit. So I think there's different strokes for different folks, and that very much works for us. I think what we need to add for parents is that it goes back to what you're saying is taking that time out. It's okay. Your baby's crying and it sucks and you're tired and you haven't had a meal and you haven't slept and it's okay to take five minutes for yourself. There should be no guilt in taking time for yourself to take a breather, to think about this really is frustrating. It's okay to think those thoughts. No one's gonna hold that against you because there's so many people in this room who are probably gonna go through the same thing, but maybe not be as transparent or honest about the ups and downs of being a parent. It is not all roses. It's not all dark clouds, but it's also okay to accept both without them crossing each other out. And that feeling, you should, you should have those feelings. Minimizing a feeling because you're a new parent and you're afraid of what people are going to think is not a good way of being mindful at all. Can I share a quick funny story? We are here to tell you that it's not all, you know, roses, but you, you will survive it. And I'll never forget when our kids were about maybe three and five and they were 
finally sleeping in their own bedrooms, but it was every half an hour waking up. One would cry, would trigger the other. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night and like saying it very loud, probably screaming, what is going on? This is inhumane. <laughs> and my husband turned to me and said, it's okay, I'll handle it. And I just, I just plopped down on my pillow and I thought, oh my God, when am I ever going to get a full night's sleep? But now I sleep, kind of, because now they go out. But we are here to tell you that you will get through it. And it is, looking back on it, you're going to think it's the most glorious experience. And you're going to forget all those horrible moments. We're almost out of time, ladies. It's incredible. But we're almost out of time. But really quickly, Corby Sue, final word for parents with respect to wellness, food, nutrition. Um, some people live to eat, some people eat to live. I would really encourage you to live to eat if you can. Try and change your mindset. Becoming a parent is genuinely the best thing I've ever done in my life and I have had a lot of success in my career but I, I fit my, my children's life into my work life for the first 10 years. Best advice my mother ever gave me was the first 20 years are not yours. And, and that's not a terrible thing. And that's the truth. And so just embrace this time. As I've shared with you, my daughter is 18. My son is 21. Best thing ever. <laughs> Dr. Kalia, final words? We live in a world of too much information. And what I can say as someone who works as a pediatrician, as a, as a pediatrician in an emergency room, know your good resources. It's OK to not know which they are, but really rely on the ones that are there to support you and you've shown that they're there for you, which is your primary care physician. And remember the emergency room is always open, regardless of what you're worried about as a primary, as a, like a primary parent, first time parent, third parent, we're there, but just be cognizant of the resources that we have in the emergency room and that we are there to be on the same page as you. We're there to provide support when we can and when we do finally see you, we hope that we can help relieve some of those concerns. If you need any additional information, I've got lots of online resources up there. But again, it's okay to not be okay sometimes. It's okay to be frustrated. It's not okay to have guilt. It's not okay to feel guilty as a new parent. Embrace it. That's the most important thing I can say at the end. Dr. Claudia, final words on spiritual wellness. Focus on self-love, self-care, because you will be of no value to anyone if you don't love yourself and value yourself first, because your children and your family will feel that. Um, because the way you love yourself is the way you're gonna love them. And just remember to focus on not feeling the guilt. Children and life is, should be ever-changing and dynamic, and just accept the change. I'm still working on that one. Yeah. So am I, you're not alone. <laughs> Thank you so much to our panelists. So many great tips and strategies shared. We hope we've given you some food for thought. We hope and wish you the best on your parenting journey. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.